Jesus' name, amen. Now, again, we're looking at James chapter 1 and verse number 22. Let's look at this, and I'll read it for you tonight. <clears throat> the Bible says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now, let's think about this just for a moment. God's word is a mechanism, is a tool, and we've said this before, that the Holy Spirit uses to help us to navigate our life, to help us to know God in a personal way, to know more about him. And it's not only given to us just to know God, but it's given to us as a tool to help us to know how to respond to God. Those are two different subjects altogether, but I want you to keep those thoughts in your mind. Now, when you look at the scripture here, there has to be a willingness on our part to cooperate with the word. Because you see, the Bible is not going to make us do anything that we do not want to do. This book and all of the words that it contains Regardless whether we receive it or reject it, whether we apply it or whether we don't, it's still the Word of God. It will always be the Word of God. The Bible says the Word is settled in heaven forever. The Word will not return void. It is the Word of God. But whether or not we apply it to our lives is another thing altogether. Most of you tonight are holding a Bible in your lap right now. It will do you no good if all you do is just read it. This passage of scripture tonight, look at it. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so what James is teaching us tonight is this, that yes, we have the word of God. And every time we open the word of God and we read it, Listen very carefully. And, and we open our hearts to it. God begins to speak to us through his word. God begins to show us his marvelous truths. But it would do us no good if all God did was to hold up the Bible, to hold up the word of God and said, this is my word. Somebody say amen. And then the, everybody would say amen. And maybe God would turn to another passage and say, this is my word. Well, we all know that this is his word. But this word will not do us any good by just saying, this is the word. It is the word. And glory to God, we have the word. But we have to have the willingness, we have to have the obedience to take this word and hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against God. And so I want us to think about this tonight. We have to have obedience to the word. You and I need this book. The truth of the matter is you and I need this book every day of our lives. Some people can go through several days of the week without opening the Bible. And I'm not talking about the days of praise devotional book. That's wonderful. And if you have that and you use that to God be the glory, I'm not speaking about Bible commentaries. If you have them, to God be the glory. My office is filled with them. I have many, many books on my shelves. But let me tell you, there is not a devotional pamphlet. There's not a book that I have in my library, nor that you have in yours, that is more applicable or more real or more true or more needed than this book, the Holy Word of God. This book is God. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And what? The Word was God. And so when we look at it tonight, I want you to think about this. If we take this Word, we take God's Word, and we read it, and then we start applying it, we start applying the truths of this book to our lives, I can promise you this, it will radically transform your life. It will do some extraordinary things for you. Now, again, it's not a force thing. 
Yes, probably there's not a person watching tonight that does not have a Bible in your home. If, if you don't have a Bible in your home, would you please let us know? And I will do everything that I possibly can to get you a Bible. Every home needs to have a Bible. But not just simply on the refrigerator or on the coffee table. You need to have access to a Bible where you can open it up at any point of the day where you're home and go to the blessed pages of Scripture and meditate and and glean from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then from that point, from that moment, whatever God reveals, whatever God shows, however God moves and leads, then do something with it. But again, the Word of God is not going to be a forced thing upon you. And I want us to get that truth tonight. So here's the thing. As Christian people, we have to get to the point in our life. Now, again, we're talking about if you want the Word of God to radically transform your life. And I'm not talking about just having a little bit of religion. You have a Bible. You have a little bit of religion. You say you're blessing over the food. I pray you do anyway. Some people don't even do that. But you've got to have more in your life about this book than just having the book in your home. You've got to have more to your faith than just saying the blessing over your food. You've got to have more in your life than saying a little prayer before you go to bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. There has to be more, excessively more in your life, in my life, that revolves around this book If, in fact, our lives are going to be radically different, radically changed, transformed. And the truth of the matter is this. Let me give you a little tip tonight. If you really want to see a difference in your life, you you really want God to rain down his blessings upon you. You truly want to be a blessed child of God. Then let me encourage you with something tonight. This is a great spiritual truth. My advice to you would be this. If you have a Bible, to God be the glory. If you read the Bible, to God be the glory. But don't just read some of it. Read all of it. And more so, let me explain it this way. Don't believe just parts of it. Believe all of it. This is the Word of God. It is given to us by the Holy Spirit. It is inspired from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation. This is God's holy word. And I would encourage you tonight that when you read the word of God and it comes down to application, don't just apply some of it, but apply all of it. Now, how much of a difference would that make in your life If you were to get to a place when you open the word of God and God began to speak to you through the Holy Spirit and God would reveal some voidness in your life. He would reveal some blind spots in your life. He would reveal some areas in your life where you know that you're falling short. And God, as he would show you these things, how much of a difference would it make in your life that when those particular things were revealed, that you actually said, yes, that's right, Lord. And then you started to apply spiritual truths and scriptures, and not only just listening to what God said in the word, but actually started doing them. Look at the verse again, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. Now, When I think of this passage of Scripture and what Jesus is teaching in other places of the Word, I'm reminded of the great Sermon on the Mount and a tremendous passage that he had shared in that message. And it goes hand in hand with what we're studying tonight. In fact, if you would, just hold your place here in James chapter 1 and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. And I want you to see this in Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse number 24. This is one of the blessings that I enjoy about Wednesday night Bible study, that I'm not uh, so pressed with time and that we can take more time leisurely to cross-reference scriptures 
and to see what the Word has to say about a particular subject that we might be dealing with in another place. And this happens to be a moment where we can do that. And so if you look in your Bibles at Matthew chapter 7, I want to begin reading in verse number 24, remembering now what we just read in James, to not only be hearers of the Word, but to be doers as well. And so Matthew 7, verse 24, Jesus is speaking in this passage, and he says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, talking about the word of God, what he has spoken, what he has preached, what he has taught, what he has said, those, he said, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, look at that, I will liken him unto a wise man, And in the first part of our study, we talked about wisdom. You remember that? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Jesus is saying this. If you take my word and not only listen to my word, not only hear it them, but notice what he said, and doeth them. He said, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. Do you remember what Jesus said in another passage? He said, upon this rock, upon himself. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let me ask you this, as a Christian Have you ever felt like that the winds of life, the toils of life were beating upon your house, your home, the place where you and your family lived? And it just felt like that it was one thing after another. Even in those kinds of storms and difficulties, we can still praise God. We can still trust the Lord. We can still raise our hands and say, thank you, Jesus. You promised never to leave me nor forsake me. Jesus said, if you take my word and you listen to what I'm saying, but not only listen to me, he said, if you do what I'm telling you to do, he says, your house, your life is going to sustain the storms of life. And notice this in verse number 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, And doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man. So listen very carefully. We're not talking about some of these things. Jesus said these things. See, when we get into a place of our own personal lives where we start looking at this Bible as if it was nothing more than a menu in a restaurant. You know how that works. You go in a restaurant and they give you the menu and you start looking over the things that is appealing to you, and you skip over the things that are not appealing to you. And if you start looking at God's Word like it was a menu, yes, I want some of this and a little bit of that, but I don't like that. I don't want none of this. Listen to what Jesus is saying. This is not pastor talking to you tonight. This is what Jesus is saying. He is saying this, that everyone that heareth my sayings, and listen, You've been in this church, you've been involved in this church long enough to know that everything that comes out of that pulpit, you have a holy Bible in front of you to know that's what God said. We're not up here making it up, trying to figure it out as it go along. You know what we're preaching is the truth. You can read it for yourself. And Jesus said this, everyone that hears it, hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not. He didn't say if you did most of them, you're in good shape. He didn't say if you go along with most of it, listen, you're going to fare well. He said if you hear my sayings and doeth them, inclusive, doeth them. Notice what he said. He said you're going to be blessed. But he said if you just hear and you don't do them. Then notice what the word says. He shall be likened unto a foolish man. Now it's one thing for somebody to call another individual a fool. But tonight, listen very carefully. Jesus 
is the one calling this person or these people out. He said they are or he is, she is a fool. You're going to be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And in verse 27, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great, great was the fall of it. As I look back over my ministry, preaching the gospel for almost over, well, over 40 years now, I've seen a lot of things happen in people's lives. And by the way, all of us, without exception, have an adversary. The Bible says he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I don't care what position you hold in the church. You might be the preacher. You might be a deacon. You might be a trustee. You might be a singer. You might be a musician. You might be a Sunday school teacher. You might be a missionary. I don't, I don't know. Whatever your position is, listen, nothing ever qualifies you to be exempt from the adversary. All of us have the adversary. Like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But this is what I've noticed in families over the last four decades and plus. And that's this. It doesn't matter how close you're walking to the Lord, or how far you are walking away from the Lord, you're going to have problems. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have difficulties. And in some cases, and in some times, those adversities that come against you, they're going to be catastrophic. They're not going to be little things. They're going to be things that separate husbands and wives, that separate children from parents. There are going to be things that just turn your life all upside down. I don't care who you are. It's Things are coming your way. But here's the thing. Jesus said this, that in the midst of the storm, if, we're, if we take this word and not only hear it, but when we start doing it, when we start applying it to our life, Jesus said that's going to make all the difference in the world. I don't know how somebody could be just cavalier with the idea that, well, oh, well, you know, this, I guess, was meant to be, and I guess this is bad, but it could be worse. And people just flow through life like, I, I can't believe this is happening, or I wish this was different or something. We just have this nonchalant attitude in some cases. <clears throat> and then in some cases, we fall to our needs and we say, oh, God, I don't know what's happening. Why all this is happening? Why is it happening to me? Why does it got to happen like this? Lord, this is devastating. I, I don't like this. I don't want this. But it comes down to this. The reactions that we have in the storm, it's not if you have a storm, it's when you have a storm. Jesus said this, if you're doing what I have told you to do, you're not only hearing me, you've tuned me in. And not only that, but you are doing the sayings of mine. You are doing what I have told you to do. Jesus said that when the storms come, he will liken you to be a house that was built upon the rock. But he said, listen, if you are not obeying me, if you are not following my voice, my word, he said, then I'm going to liken you into a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And then when the rains come, not if, but when. When the adversary comes, not if, but when. The Bible says that if we're not doing what he has told us to do, the Bible says that our house is going to fall. And notice this, the winds blew and the and beat upon that house and it fell. And the word says, and great, great was the fall of it. Now let's step back from this tonight and let's assess this from a very practicable, a very realistic approach. If we know the storms of life are coming, sometimes they come one at a time, sometimes they come in bunches, but if we know that they're coming, 
And you can use the Bible as, as your weatherman. The Bible here teaches us that the storms of life are coming. Pay attention to the word. You know, when storms take place in our community, and we've recently heard about the storms that has affected the West Coast and out in the Gulf Coast and uh, storms that have been forming off of the Atlantic. We've recently been hearing about all of this. We know this because we tune in the weather and we watch the weather report and we know those storms are coming. Sometimes the storms are catastrophic. But we know we can prepare a little bit because of the weatherman. They come on the TV and they give us all this information and we know how to prepare, especially when these storms are coming into our neighborhood, so to speak. It's the same principle with the Word of God. God's Word has spoken and He has said clearly that the storms are coming. The adversary is coming. The demons of hell, they're coming. And Jesus said, when they come... If you're not only listening to my word, but if you're doing them, if you're obeying what I've said, Jesus said, when the storms come, he said, I'm going to liken that person that built his foundation upon a rock. But if you don't listen to me, if you don't obey my words, then Jesus said, when the storms come, I'm going to liken that man as a fool and his house will fall and not only fall in a small way, but he said the fall would be great and great was the fall of it. You know, people read the Bible for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes people read the Bible because they're fascinated with the history and the Bible is full of history. But some people just are intrigued with history and in history alone, and that's predominantly why they choose to read the Word. Some people read the Word because they're captivated with the philosophies of the Scripture, and they compare it to other philosophies of other religions. Some people read the Word because they are intrigued with the Mosaic Law, and they try to study and and to read up on that and learn all about that that they possibly can. Some people read the Word of God just to find fault with it. I know people like that. They don't believe it, but they like to try to find contradictions about it. Some people read the Bible just to polish up on their Greek or their Hebrew or their Aramaic or vocabularies. They, they are intrigued by that. Some people read the Bible just to have devotions. Some people read the Bible because they simply like to study just primarily the doctrines. Some people read the Bible and studying it just because they have nothing else or no other interest. They have no other pastimes. It's getting late at night and before they go to bed, they just say, well, okay, I'm going to read a passage tonight. But listen carefully. Some people <clears throat> read the Bible because they truly want not only to hear from God, they want to know what he says. What can I do to better my life? What can I do to better myself? What can I do to draw closer to the Lord? What can I do to have a better relationship with him? But here's the thing. When we read the word, Jesus said, Whosoever heareth my sayings and doeth them. Here's a great spiritual truth for you tonight. Try to remember this. Because this is where one size fits all. This applies to every one of us. When you read the book, you open it up. And by the way, every time you open up this book and read it, you hear from God. When you pray, you talk to him. But when you open this book, you hear from him. And when you open this book and you read it because you do want to hear from him, here's the spiritual truth. This book demands a response. This Bible demands a response. And that's where it comes into whether 
you will respond to it in obedience or you will respond and say, I don't want to do that. You may respond and say, that's too much for me. That's too big of a cross for me. I, I don't want that. I'll do a little of this, but not that. Listen, when you read the Word of God, it demands a response. My pastoral advice tonight is this, to whatever he says, do it. So let me read the scripture again. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now, notice verse number 23. James continues with this idea that the word of God demands a response. In verse 23, he says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Maybe you've read that scripture before and you really don't know what that means. James continues now to drive this point and he's talking about knowing what to do and not doing it. Just simply not doing anything. Have you ever heard the old expression, and I'm sure all of you have, is that actions speak louder than words? Let me say it again. Actions speak louder than words. I want to give you an Old Testament example of what I'm talking about in this study tonight here at this passage with actions speak louder than words. I want you to try to think with me in the Old Testament. Most of you are very familiar with David and Jonathan. Do you remember Jonathan was the son of King Saul? Let me say this, and let me ask the questions. You remember the story where David was getting ready uh, to kill the giant? Let me back up just a little bit from that. The Philistines were on one side of what the Bible describes to be the Valley of Elah. I've been to the Valley of Elah many times. I've taken people from our church, and uh, we have parked the tour bus on the side of the road, and we... Uh, I allowed the group, we took the group down into the valley and I let them take five smooth stones from the brook and uh, it, it's just an amazing place to go and see and uh, maybe God willing sometime in the future down the road we can take another tour and I would love for you to go with me. I always try to put the Valley of Elah on the tour and we've done that many times but I want you to remember now, the Philistines were camped on one side of the valley. The Israelites were on the other. And every day, Goliath, he would come down into the gorge and he would cry out to the children of Israel. And he was, he was mocking God, blaspheming God, belittling the children of Israel. And he wanted somebody to come out and fight him. And he was doing this day after day after day. Now my question is, how many days did Jonathan, who was a great warrior, just like his father Saul, how many days did Jonathan, the great warrior, let go by before David showed up on the scene? Have you ever thought about that? Can you imagine this now? The host of the Philistines, they're in their armor. They're ready for battle. They're ready to defeat the children of Israel. They're ready for victory. The children of Israel are scared out of their minds. They know they cannot conquer this army. They know that they have nobody in their platoon, their regiment that can go down and even slightly deal with this man, Goliath. So Jonathan now is part of the children of Israel. Can you imagine his father looking out day after day to the army that was opposing them? And he was listening day after day to Goliath, blaspheming God, challenging them. So you think about this. Every day, Goliath, he hurled his voice to the children of Israel, and he challenged them to come out and to do battle with them. And think with me now. 
But then David shows up on the scene, a little shepherd boy. And when David shows up on the scene and he is there to see his family primarily, bringing them lunch or checking in to see how they're all doing, David shows up on the scene and he hears this commotion. He hears Goliath challenging the children of Israel. He sees all of the mighty warriors in the Israeli army, but they're frightened and they're scared and they're intimidated. And David is a little shepherd boy. And in all of this pandemonium and commotion, David hears the giant challenging somebody to come down and do battle with him. Finally, David gets bold and he gets agitated. And he raises back and he says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Now you think about that just for a moment. I don't want to spend a lot of time with the story of David taking the stone and putting it in his sling and killing Goliath. You know the story. David ultimately defeated Goliath. Now, as a result of that, I want to show you something. It's going to take just a few extra minutes, but I want you to go back to the book of 1 Samuel with me. Will you turn there? I want you to go to the book of 1 Samuel with me tonight. And I want you to look at chapter 18 because I'm going to show you something interesting. And this was an intricate part of the relationship that Jonathan and David had shared. What are we talking about, preacher, while you're turning to 1 Samuel chapter 18? We're talking about actions speak louder than words. You see, if we're just hearers, if all we're doing is just hearing the word, that's great. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But Jesus said, we have to take this to another level. It's not just hearing, but it's doing. So now I want to give you this classic illustration from the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, I want you to see this. And I want you to notice with me verses 1 through 4. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan, look at this, was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David, notice this, made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. So you think about this now. Jonathan is making all kinds of promises and expressions of love and his fondness for David. And so now I want you to see this in chapter 20. We move forward a little bit and notice in verse number four. Jonathan makes a great promise. He expressed compassionate words to David. And this is what he said. 1 Samuel 20, verse number four. Then said Jonathan unto David, whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. What a promise. What a commitment. What words. Great words. But I reemphasize, actions speak louder than words. These were great words that Jonathan expressed to David. Can you not see the affection in it? Powerful words. But the truth of the matter is this. And the sad thing to all of that story is that Jonathan, according to the word of God, after making that great declaration, and that particular exchange of friendship, listen, Jonathan never went any farther with David. He did not share in his personal rejection. He did not spend one night with him in the cave. When David was running as a fugitive, he was in the caves of En Gedi. I have been to En Gedi. I have been to the place. 
Jonathan never spent one night with David in the cave. Jonathan never became a wanderer with David for the next 12 years as a fugitive. But again, like the old saying, actions speak louder than words. And so I want to wrap up the Bible study tonight with this, that when we hear the word of God, when we have the word of God, we read the word of God. This book demands a response, not just listening. But God's word requires us to do. And not to do some of it, but to do all of it. That comes through obedience. You've read the story in Matthew 7, and you can see it clearly here tonight in James chapter 1. Well, this is all the time we have tonight.